Hey all and welcome to another long awaited tutorial. When it comes to building structures, I typically build kits from manufacturers. However today I'm going to use all the tools I have at my disposal to build a scratch built industrial building using mostly laser cut acrylic with some 3D printed details. I know a lot of you won't have access to these types of tools, especially laser cutters. However, laser cutting is basically just an accurate way of cutting flat sheets, so if you have a steady hand and a ruler, you can get results just as good using your hand cutting methods. Additionally, there are companies out there that will laser cut your designs and also 3D print models for you. So let's not waste any more time and get started building. While staying in a hotel, I saw this interesting looking building and thought it would make for a nice model. When scratch building an actual location, it really helps to be able to get some good reference photos and close up shots if you can. Having a size reference really helps as well, otherwise you can always use something like a door as a reference because they are usually a standard height. The main structure files that will be sent to the laser cutter are all made using Adobe Illustrator. The laser cutter I'm using is the BMO from Flux 3D. The material of choice is one, one and a half and two millimeter acrylic sheets. It's quite a small laser cutter and the cutting area is just slightly larger than an A4 piece of paper. With the material in place, I simply import the SVG file and position it within the cutting area. A handy feature with this laser cutter is the image capture. This way you can make sure your file to be cut will be positioned over the material in the machine, enabling you to make the most of the material and ensure you have minimal waste. Now we just set the power and watch it cut through the acrylic like a hot knife through butter. You can also lower the power to engrave pieces without cutting all the way through. Great for brick detail and metal siding. I've basically created a kit and now I just need to assemble it. The glue I'm using is a liquid solvent cement specifically for acrylic. Just be sure to use in a well ventilated area. An added benefit of having tools like a laser cutter and 3D printer is you can quickly and easily create additional tools like this small ribbing guide. It ensures I get the perfect spacing for the roof ribs. You'll also benefit from having a few squares and machinist blocks to help keep everything square and plumb. The laser cutter is also capable of cutting styrene, however it will leave a slightly raised edge depending on how thick the styrene is, the thinner the better. Nearly all of the exterior 3D detail was printed on the Ben E4 Mono 3D printer from Nova 3D. I used a free online program called Tinkercad to create the parts I needed like these stairs. Once the model has been designed and sized appropriately, I export the STL files onto my computer. Next, the files are loaded into the Novamaker slicing program where I'll add supports along the model and a raft so it adheres to the build plate. There is an option to automate this process, however, I generally prefer to add the supports manually for smaller models. Next, it's just a matter of loading the file into the 3D printer using the USB. Select the file you want and hit print. Using resin printers can be a little trickier compared to filament printers. Namely, the uncured resin is bad for your skin, so care should be taken when cleaning the parts. Gloves are a must. After the excess resin has been cleaned away in a bath of isopropyl alcohol, the model is dried and then put in the curing chamber for about 10 to 15 minutes to make sure the model is fully cured and hardened. 3D printed parts can be assembled like any other plastic part. The supports are removed, any excess flash and resin is sanded and smoothed as necessary, and to fix the resin parts together, I use some superglue gel. Superglue works very well on resin and will give a permanent bond. Any hardened superglue can be sanded away. Because the stairs are quite large, I'm going to use a metal wire to hold them onto the wall. In order to straighten the wire, I hold one end with the drill and the other end is held with some pliers. While pulling on the wire to create tension, I turn the drill. The end result is a perfectly straight piece of wire. 
The pieces of wire are cut and glued into the stairs, again using super glue. A paper template is used when it comes to drilling the holes in the main wall. The wire supports were an afterthought, so in hindsight, I could have added the holes during the laser cutting process. Now when I attach the stairs, they will be much more secure. Now we can give the model a nice grey undercoat, so it will be ready for its paint job. The rest of the diorama sections are formed and cut with 1mm styrene, again on the laser cutter. With all the separate parts cut and placed, I measure the total length and width that I'll need for the base. 7mm plywood makes for a good sturdy base. It's reasonably lightweight and easy to cut with a jigsaw. You'll notice as I assemble the base, there is a cutaway both in the front and a small cutaway at the rear. The front cutaway is for a future add-on that I'll be doing with the model, and the rear cutaway is for the motor parts that power the Magna Rail. I also want to make sure the main structure is removable. That way I can use it on a future layout if desired, and it will make repairs and add-ons much easier to do. To give the whole building a bit more strength, I use hot glue along most of the inside edges. The rest of the model, like the road and footpath, are all permanent and get glued down with polyurethane glue. Just remember to weigh down the parts as the polyurethane glue will expand as it cures. These holes that descend below the road are for a sewer system that will be featured in an upcoming video, so for now they won't be used. The tracks for the Magnarel are fashioned using 1mm styrene. Magnarel comes with pre-made track, however I didn't have enough for this project, so I managed to make do with some styrene. It was a lot of extra work, but achievable. The main components for the Magnarel is the motor mechanism and the chain links, plus a small amount of track that I'll be using along the rear of the diorama. The main driver for the system is going to be mounted under the building, so that it will be hidden from view, but at the same time easy to access should I need to. One of the more underappreciated tools in my drawer is the Dremel. I actually use this tool quite a lot, and it's a great tool to have at your disposal. Mounting the hardware is easy enough. Again, I use screws to hold it down so that I will have the option to remove it again later. For the track, I just remove any excess plastic, and glue it down, making sure it lines up perfectly with the styrene channel we created earlier. I also make sure to give it a test run, just to make sure it works properly before adding the road surface. The channel depth is perfectly 7mm, so some strips of 7mm plywood can be used to fill out the area directly beneath the road. A product I recently discovered at Bunnings is this filler. It's perfect for filling reasonably large gaps and won't shrink. It sands well and can be built up just like I did here to make a smooth transition between the footpath and the driveway. It's important to keep the track channel clean, so anytime I do anything like painting the undercoat on this footpath, I make sure the track will remain clean by masking it off. Now for the 3D printed parts. They all need to be removed from their supports, sanded, and filed to remove any lumps and bumps and imperfections. Parts that are warped can be straightened by applying a very small amount of heat to soften the resin. Next, either use a straight edge or your hand to bend the part back into the desired position. Hold it there as the part cools back down and it will be straight again. The beauty of building your own models is you can make parts fit perfectly with minimal work, just like these doors. And just like any other model, everything is primed and painted. I have a special technique for painting footpaths and roads. Colour choice is completely optional. I like to use a nice warm cement colour as the base coat. You'll need an airbrush to do the following effect. With the desired colour, in this case a grey, I turn down the air pressure on the airbrush. Keep turning it down until you get a spray pattern that looks speckled like this. Now I just run the airbrush along the surface, leaving behind the speckled flecks across the footpath. This technique makes it much easier to apply this effect on vertical walls and in hard to reach areas. I apply a variety of colours using this method. 
some dark greys and greens, as well as some lighter colour like off-white and ivory. Next, a grimy oil wash is applied with MIG oil brusher and some enamel thinners. You can take your time with this step as the oil is very forgiving and takes ages to dry. The mixture is quite thin and is applied across the entire surface. Once done, a paper towel is lightly dabbed over the footpath. This step adds a very subtle textured look and will also remove any excess oil paint. And finally, a light misting of the original base colour is applied over the top. The road surface was made using polypropylene and cut using the laser cutter. It's painted in a similar fashion to the footpath, however the effect is done with Rust-Oleum spray instead. Again, colour is optional, but I've found Primer Grey works great as a base and Heirloom White is a good speckled top coat. Don't forget to use in a well-ventilated area and use a mask. You don't want to be breathing this into your lungs. For the wash, instead of using oil paint and thinners, I'm using an acrylic wash. It's a muddy black colour. The thinners reacts with the Rust-Oleum paint and will cause it to smudge and lift away. It's basically the same technique, however I had to apply a couple of coats to get the look I wanted. Using the hairdryer helps speed up the drying time between coats. The road also has a dark grey top coat applied, which will help bring all the colours together. Remember it's only a very light misting as we want the previous layers to show through. As a last step on the road, I'll be adding a layer of dull coat. This will seal the road permanently. I'm doing this mainly because it will be using the Magnarel system and it will have small metal sleds being dragged across the surface. The layer of dull coat will help protect the surface and prevent scratches and bits of paint peeling away. Line markings are a great addition to any road and really add so much detail. They are quite simple to add. Just ensure you mask off any areas that you don't want white paint. I find ivory or off-white works best as a white road line. If while peeling away the masking tape you find the paint peels away, you can always make them look like road repairs. Now we're ready to fix the road to the diorama. I generally like to use a slow setting glue here so that it gives me a chance to position the road before it's permanent. Polyurethane glue is a good option, but you'll only need a very thin layer. You don't want it oozing out from unwanted areas. I run the Magnarel links as the glue cures just to make sure nothing is obstructing the Magnarel from it working smoothly. While that's drying, I'll start painting. Scale Modeler's Supply have an impressive range of paints that I'll be using for portions of this build. They go on smooth and mix well. You'll know when they are fully mixed because you should be able to see bubbles on the bottom of the bottle. In hindsight, given that I'm painting this model a very light sandy colour, I should have given it a white undercoat. Nevertheless, after a few extra coats, I got a really good colour. With the main base colours down on the building, I proceed to paint all of the 3D printed details. Some of the more complex shapes, like the staircase, I painted and weathered before attaching it to the building. All the parts are glued onto the main structure using super glue. It's pretty amazing what detail can be achieved now with 3D printers. Some items like the long air vents are aligned using a paper template. This just ensures I get them vertical and at the correct spacing. Some parts of the model, like the top shed, are built using more standard techniques. Some styrene H-beam and rod. This too could be 3D printed, however sometimes using old tried and true methods are just easier. With a bit of paint and some weathering, it really starts to take shape. The end wall is a brick structure. It was fashioned using Jarvis brick sheet. Individual bricks are randomly painted for a bit of extra detail and the entire wall is covered in a sludge wash using some Scale Modeler's Supply Earth Powder. 
It starts as a dry application, but I later add water to create the sludge. Once dry, excess powder is wiped away until you reach the desired effect. The rest of the building is weathered with more scale modeler supply pigments. About 90% of the model is weathered with the earth pigment and the other pigments were randomly used for a touch of color in certain spots. Now for some scenery. The landform is built up with sculpted modeling mix, which can be found in the Officeworks online store. It's mixed up to a thick consistency so that it can still hold its shape and applied in the desired areas being careful not to get it all over the side of the building and on the road. Once dry, it gets a coat of brown paint. While the paint is still wet, I sprinkle over some dirt texturing. This is a mix of dry sifted dirt from the backyard, mixed with some beige tile grout to get the desired color. Doing this while the paint is still wet ensures that the dirt sticks to the shallow slopes in the terrain. To remove the excess, I use the airbrush with the airflow turned right down. Just enough airflow to blow away the dust and small rocks from the road. To fix all the dirt in place, it gets a soaking in isopropyl alcohol, followed with some scenic glue. While that layer dries, I'll start working on the MagnaRail wiring. I'm using a PWM speed controller from JCAR to vary the speed of the motor. To house the components, I fashioned a small box to hold everything. That way all I have to do is connect the motor and then the 12 volt battery pack and we're in action. With the box glued in and the motor mounted, it's pretty much ready to go. The switch allows me to change direction. All I need to do now is connect all of these small links. Just making sure there is a good spread of magnets along its length. The hard part is threading them into the track, but with a bit of patience, you'll have it done before you know it. It's important to get the tension just right. You can adjust it by changing out small links for larger ones until it's perfect. A quick test will tell you if it's good. The road surface in the building will be temporary. To do this, I use hobby tack adhesive to hold it down, and on the connection points at each end, I use some clear sticky tape. Now for my favorite part, scenery. Because this area is so small, I'm using the WWS Pro Grass Detail Applicator and a mixture of their grasses. I pre-fill the grass hopper with some two millimeter grass and set it aside. Next, all the areas I want grass patches, I apply a lightly diluted mixture of Mod Podge Matte. Once happy with the amount of coverage, I turn on the grass applicator and hold it roughly two to three centimeters above the surface, while at the same time holding the negative grounding wire close to the area where I'm applying the grass. The small fibers tend to fall through the wire mesh on their own. For the longer grass fibers, you may need to shake the applicator to get them to fall through. Excess is collected using a vacuum with a stocking over the top. That way we can collect the loose fibers and use them on other projects. Layers can be built up by applying glue over previous layers and repeating the process. For extremely small areas, there's an even smaller attachment. This is ideal for adding tiny tufts in hard to reach areas without sending grass fibers all over your entire model. You can see just how effective this is and how much more interest small details like this add to the scene. More texturing is added with some Woodland Scenics turf and blended leaf material. It's randomly placed over the grassed areas just adding a little more interest and variety in color. The leaf texture is some dead leaves and bark from the garden that is blended into a fine texture. It makes quite the difference. 
To lock everything in place, I seal it with my two-step process, isopropyl alcohol followed by scenic glue, doing my best to avoid overspray. Excess glue can be soaked up using a paper towel. For trees, I'm using a Bachmann oak tree. This is one of the trees I set on fire in a previous video to make some improvements. It's set into the scenery by drilling a hole and filling it with straight Mod Podge. With the tree positioned, I add some more of the blended leaves textures to hide the white plaster that's visible. More shrubbery can be added using some Woodland Scenics fine leaf foliage in areas along the front side of the building. To hide some of the see-through windows, I print some building interiors and lightly tack them onto the wall with some tacky glue. The base gets a coat of black paint to help frame the top of the diorama. In a future video, the sewer system along with additional detail like lighting effects will be added. And lastly, some view blocks are hot glued to the back of the building. So when viewed from the front, you won't be able to look past the back of the building. As you can see, this is such a fun model to look at. There is so much going on and the addition of vehicles makes it feel so much more interactive. Be sure to stay tuned to the channel for the update to this video. I'll be adding a lot of lighting effects to both the building and the sewer system, as well as lighting effects for the vehicles that travel along the Magna Rail. Don't forget to subscribe so I know you're enjoying the videos. Cheers and thanks for watching.